It happened two weeks ago on a Sunday night, and I was in for quite a blessing and a surprise. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in Colorado Springs. I want to welcome you. Glad you're tuning in. Let us know how we can pray for you and where you're watching from. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for surprises, the serendipities of life that inject us into the midst of a need with an opportunity to represent your kingdom. Help us to not look past people, but to see people as you do, with infinite kindness, grace, and love. And thank you that at this time of the year, we can exhibit much needed kindness to those around us. Guide this time in your word. Bless everyone watching. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. So it happened, uh, as I said, on a Sunday night, after concluding a study, uh, at least week six or so of a study, called Experiencing God, How to Find and Know and Do the Will of God. And we had talked about God's invitation to us and how he's always at work around us and invites us to be involved in what he's doing. So it was right after that study that Laura and I went to Walmart. Typical Sunday night at Walmart. And not too long after we got through the doors, I saw a man with a chihuahua and clutched to his chest and he looked disheveled and appeared to be homeless. And uh, he passed me by and I kept shopping and not too long after that, I was in the same aisle as him, and, and for a moment, it seemed like everyone else melted away, and he looked at me. He said, since you're a man, I'm going to ask you a question. I said, okay, and he had in his cart one lone loaf of bread. He said, would you buy this loaf of bread for me so I can have something to eat? I said, I will. He said, I'll be right back. He said, uh, by the way, do you mind if I get something to put on that bread, like some lunch meat? I said, go ahead. And he left me with his cart and took the chihuahua with him. And I'm with my cart, and he comes back with lunch meat. I happen to be in the chips aisle, and I said, would you like some chips? He said, I would. So he picked out the chips. And then he said to me, uh, would you mind if I got some milk? I said, no, let's go find the milk. And we found the milk, and he said, you know, It'd be great if I had some cereal for that milk in the morning. I said, it would be. Let's get this uh, little box of cereal that has a different flavors in it. And uh, bought that for him. And uh, found out his name was Gary, 70 years old, homeless, had been living in a homeless camp near Fort Carson here in Colorado Springs. And they had bulldozed his whole camp. And he was hungry. And this is the first time he told me he'd ever done anything like that. So we made our way to the checkout area, and he uh, saw some little pies there. He said, I think I'd like these too. He said, but I've got money for these. I said, no, just put them in the cart. And I said to him, he asked me, he said, tell me your name. I said, my name is Mark, and I'm a pastor of a church that cares for the homeless, that cares about you, Gary, and of all the people you could have walked into tonight in the Walmart. You walked into someone's life who represents someone who loves you very deeply. And I felt so privileged to help him. And he thanked me. And I invited him to church. And I told him we have a weekly meal for the homeless. And we have clothing too. And we can help you. And at that moment... I felt so honored to represent the kingdom. There's times when I don't do a good job of it, nor do you. When God invites and we ignore, when people seek help and we walk away. But sometimes we get it right. And helping him was the right thing to do. He was facing a harsh time. It's my privilege on this first Sunday in December to share with you that in the harsh times, the Lord really cares about you. The prophet Elijah will help a certain widow in Zarephath and will remind us of God's nearness always. And so we're in the book of 1 Kings today, chapter 17, verses 8 
through 16 under that title, The Harsh Times. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah in the harsh times. I am pleased to let you know that we are guided by the Lord. In the harsh times, we are provided by the Lord. And in the harsh time, we are comforted by the Lord. Notice, first of all, under that title, in the harsh times, we are guided by the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow to lead you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. You know, life is never static. It seems like it is sometimes, doesn't it? It seems like every day is a repeat of the day before. We're on an instant replay reel of some kind. But change comes, and change is coming into your life. You don't know who you'll meet or who you'll encounter that will uh, send your life in a whole new direction, but the Lord knows. And that's why the Bible says the steps of a good man and a good woman are directed by the Lord and he delighteth in their way. And if you will delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Elijah is on the heels of facing 400 plus false prophets on Mount Carmel and uh, rising, uh, causing a, a woman to rise up named Jezebel and Ahab, her husband, to want to end his life. And so he's on the run, and he's run about as far as he can. And he's been cared for by God's provision, by uh, ravens bringing him food. He's been by the, the brook Cherith. And God has something planned for him. He had provided for Elijah just like he plans to provide for a widow in Zarephath over 100 miles away from where he is. And he's on his way, and you're on your way. It may seem like life is stagnant and life is purposeless, but God orchestrates our coming in and our going out. Elijah has been cared for, and Elijah will care for someone else. He's in a region of land that is in modern-day Lebanon that you see pictured on your screen, more than 100 miles from the safety and seclusion of the brook Cherith. He will walk that distance knowing that he is public enemy number one. There's an all-points bulletin out for Elijah, and there are assassins that await him. There's a price on his head, I'm certain of it. And he has to navigate, most likely by darkness, to Zarephath. But he follows God's guidance. And I want you to know something. You can trust God with the direction of your own life. I often think of this quote. I may not be where I thought I would be, but I think I'm where I'm supposed to be. And just as God took my life and intersected it with Gary's life at a Walmart in Colorado Springs, he can take your life and place you at just the right juncture in someone else's life with the right intersection for a whole new beginning. God watches over his own. That's a promise. And he's watching over you. And you need to know that, especially when you find yourself in the harsh 
times. He had eluded assassins, working for Jezebel, hiding in the daylight hours, traveling under the cover of darkness, always looking over his shoulder. The Lord Jesus told the disciples when he sent them out in Matthew 10, 16, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. God may indeed, Dave Roper said, set us down in perilous places, neighborhoods, offices, and classrooms. Elijah was a man like us, but God was with him, and God is with you. We are guided by the Lord. Notice when God directs us, however, it leads often to a crisis of belief. The crisis of belief is one of the principles of the study we're in right now at the church here in Colorado Springs, experiencing God. It's a time in our life, a, a segment of our life, when we must decide to follow and obey God's leading, even when it seems troubling to us. We sometimes are overwhelmed with the task that he has given us. For instance, we can't fathom how we can accomplish what he's asked us to do. We feel ill-equipped for the mission. We think, I won't enjoy this job. We cannot make financial sense of his request. We have a million reasons why we cannot move to where he's leading. All of those excuses, listen, all of those doubts, all of our reasons, all that hinders us from following and obeying God's leading in our life is saying, we don't believe that you can accomplish what you've called us to do. We don't believe that you're able to equip us. We do not believe that you, we will be enjoying your service or find joy in it. And we don't believe you'll provide. And the scripture says in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go, arise to the widow of Zarephath, which belongs inside, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. I'm sure that between God's directives and Elijah getting up could have been including some dialogue between him and the Lord. You're going to send me a hundred miles into enemy territory when you know that Jezebel and her husband are after me you want me to leave the protection here where you have fed me with the ravens and even baked a cake and put it by my own head with this fresh water to drink? And you want me to go over there? I don't know that that's a wise idea. <laughs> Sometimes we want to advise God on our lives. And the best thing we can do is to trust him with our lives. Just sign a, a blank sheet of paper and say, Sign your name and say, Lord, you fill in the details. <laughs> Life becomes so much more exciting that way because you never know what he will bring or how he will bless you in your life, but he will. Uh, God's promises are yea in Christ Jesus for sure. Elijah will go to an unlikely source, but his obedience will have some far-reaching consequences. And when you and I are faithful to do what the Lord tells us to do, through a scripture, and someone said 90% of the will of God is in the word of God. So know what it says. But when he releases us to an opportunity, uh, it's in, incredibly important that we say, yes, Lord, two words that will change your life. Yes, Lord, we are provided by the Lord. Do you see it in the text? I love this passage of scripture. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was gathering sticks. Well, sure she was. She was going to use those sticks to make a little fire, take a little bit of flour she had left and oil and bake her last supper, really, her last meal. She had no concept that there was going to be any food on the tomorrows of her life. She was sure that she was going to die. Have you ever been in such a tight place, didn't know where you're going to turn, and then God in the 11th hour provided for you? When Laura and I were first uh, married in August of 1981, for some reason, we didn't think, and we should have, 
to secure housing in Abilene, Texas, where Hardin Simmons University was, uh, because we need some place to live. We should have got a house set up. We we could have. We got buried in August. We fell in love uh, sometime before that. Had all of uh, uh, 1981, there, January through August, to call housing, but we never did. We left on faith, and uh, we got to Abilene, and that time in history, there's three colleges in Abilene, Abilene Christian, McMurray College, Hardin-Simmons University. There was nowhere for us to live, no place, no housing of any kind. 100% uh, occupancy in that city in August of 1981. So we were in the Holiday Inn. And back then, we were paying all of $35 a night. And I so remember leaning over the Toyota Celica we had. Laura was in the passenger seat. I was outside the car in the parking lot of that Holiday Inn. And I said to her, I said, if we don't find a house tomorrow, we're going home. Meaning we're going to go back to Colorado. Forget this. Must not be God's will. The next day, we saw an ad in the paper for one house. We went to see that house with a lady named Miss Davis, who had the big Texas bouffant hairdo. And I tried to charm that woman six ways to Sunday. And I think I was overzealous because she looked at me after she showed us the house and she said, I'm going to rent this house to you because I like Laura. <laughs> She's a smart woman. And she did. And we stayed there all the way through my undergraduate degree. We discovered, Laura and I, in the very early part of our marriage, that if God guides you to a place, he will provide a place for you to live. And he did it. Even though we weren't wise in how we got there, he overcame our ignorance and gave us a place to live. I think of Elijah going to a widow in Zarephath, widows of all people, were quite destitute, especially during this time in history. If a widow's family didn't care for her like uh, Boaz cared for uh, Naomi when he married Ruth, widows would struggle and become really some of the most poorest people in a culture and very vulnerable in those societies. Why would God send Elijah to a widow who didn't even hardly have enough to make more than a biscuit? because he wanted to bless that widow and teach Elijah a lesson, and us too, 2,500, 3,000 years later, that what you entrust to God, you can trust him with it. And he can take something and make something out of it, and nothing out of it and make it something. That's what God does. The economy of God is astounding. Does God need our finances? Does God need our service? He can have ravens bring food to a prophet who's on the run from Jezebel. But he chooses to use us. And when your moment comes, make the most of it. Ask God to give you a sensitive heart. So when a man holding a chihuahua encounters you at Walmart with one loaf of bread in his cart, it might be that God wants you to be sure to buy some meat and milk and chips and cereal and pies because God wanted to bless that homeless man on a Sunday night in this city. I'm so glad I didn't miss that moment. And I pray that those moments keep coming. And I pray that I'll be more sensitive. And I pray that you'll be more sensitive. And if you're right now in a harsh time, I pray that you'd rest and trust in God's provision and his promises. Why are we here? The same reason that God wants to use people of all different walks of life. In his loving kindness, he extends us his nail-scarred hands and offers redemption. And then with the forgiveness comes becoming a part of a family that stretches all over the world. And the sun never sets on a follower of Christ. And he wants to use us. It staggers our minds that he would use us in hard times and difficult times and harsh times. And welcome that is a privilege to serve him here it's a privilege to be here listen to me don't look past here don't look like out there is a better place or a more 
uh, welcoming place. This is the place he's placed you. And don't look past the now. In the harsh times, we're guided by the Lord. In the harsh times, we are provided by the Lord. That lady never forgot that prophet stopping by. And I'm sure long after he left, the Lord took care of her and her household. And then, do you notice finally, we are comforted by the Lord. Elijah said to her, do not fear. Do, as, do what I say. Make a little cake first, bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, that means it won't run out, and the jar of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. He has a faith that may seem to be insanity. He speaks three words, or these famous words, I should say, that God is forever speaking to us, do not fear. 365 times he says that in the word of God, one for every day of the year. God sends his message to not fear. You may need that word today. Maybe you're fearing what's happening to you now. Trust God, obey God, and God will work within you. She places the last of their meager supper in front of him and they share it together and she finds out there's enough for seconds <laughs> Elijah's a preacher he might have had thirds who knows later when it comes to her next meal there's still something in the jar and for the next meal and the meal after that and the one after that she has a son in the household if Lord I've been blessed with three sons and now we have a grandson and they are always wondering if there's more in the cupboard. In the providence of God, there will always be his provision for you. God provided. Will God do that for you? Yes. Elijah has five important lessons for us today. Number one, we cannot control this world, so we're much better off to let go of our plans and lean into God's purpose in changing his world. God's plan, plans for you involves time, sometimes alone in the desert, and time together to serve him and others, find comfort in both places. God wants us to ask what we need in prayer, believing prayer. Pray and receive. Doubt. Do without. Compassion, not control, is the key to living in this world. <clears throat> Look for people to bless on purpose. God wants us to trust him. And sometimes it won't make sense to you. Sometimes it won't make sense to the minds of those in the world. Vibrant faith involves walking into the unknown. A logical path, perhaps, by some assumptions but it's a path that god will lead you through and on and observing god walking with us and using us with us following his will in the harsh times i'm telling you we are guided in the harsh times we are provided for and in the harsh times we are comforted by the lord do you know him? If you don't, today is the most spectacular opportunity that you've ever had in your life to lean into the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord, to turn from sin and to turn to Christ and ask him to take over the reins of your life, to be everything you've ever wanted God to be, a confidant, a friend, a real father, and a comfort in the harsh, inevitably harsh times of life. If you don't know him, pray a prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to this world, <clears throat> living a sinless life, dying on the cross and rising from the grave. And I believe in you. I need you. Please forgive me of my sins. I'm trusting you 
with my life, my future, my hopes, my dreams, my aspirations, my frustrations. I lay them at your feet. Lord God, I want to know you. I want to know your son. And I want the Holy Spirit of God to come into my life. And in the harsh times, I will trust you. In the times when everything is sunny side up, I will praise you. And in between, I will lean into you. Thank you for hope that we have in the risen Christ. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas season. December will go and come and go before you know it. But with it will be opportunities to engage the culture, to help someone, and maybe God has sent a Gary into your life this Sunday night. If he does, make sure he gets his bread and his meat, his milk and his pies for the glory of God. Have a great afternoon, folks. Bye-bye.